Hey, on my Travel Ones podcast, today I'm lucky to have Maria Coraliva. How are you today, Maria? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Did I say your name right? I just want to make sure. Yes. Uh, well, almost. Coraliva. Coraliva. <laughs> it actually means queen in Russian, since I was born and raised in, in Russia. Uh, enough said, then. <laughs> the queen. That's what, no, I'll just call you the queen. Yeah, sure, that's that's fine with me. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for coming on. You're a, a two-time Olympian in synchronized swimming in the duets, I believe, correct? Mm-hmm. Yep, that's it. Ah, and, and then also, you also competed at Stanford at the college level, which I honestly didn't know they did synchronized swimming at the college level. Yeah, yeah, they do. So we're not officially an NC2A sport, but there are quite a lot of schools around the country that have synchronized swimming programs. A lot of them are club. Um, Stanford was uh, varsity, and we're obviously a, D- a D1 school. So, yeah, it was a really cool experience. You know, being a student athlete, I think, is, is really, really cool in college. Well, especially up there. I mean, that, that, that campus, I mean, at least my, my impression, of, you know, you get into Palo Alto, and it's it's a great college town. And the student athlete level up there is phenomenal. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think I I think Stanford is obviously one of the one of the best schools in the world and I think it's I think it's amazing that we have so many high caliber athletes who also are so strong academically. I think it's it's quite amazing, but also poses a lot of challenges when you're traveling and competing and you know, for me personally, I was for for several of the years I was trying to also train on the national team and compete for the national team while swimming for Stanford and obviously going to school. So definitely poses some unique uh, hurdles to overcome. Yeah, is, that, is that just all scheduling and, and not, pretty, and not yeah. being a friend or boyfriend? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, <laughs> I personally feel like I got the full college experience, even though I was juggling so many things. And like I said, my, like my experience was even different than a regular student athlete because I was, you know, doing this whole national team, national team thing. Yeah. And I had to take my senior year off completely to train for the Olympics. Um, and then, yeah, just a lot of travel, trying to figure out how to, you know, do your work, take tests, things like that. Now, d- did you see a difference between tra- uh, traveling for, for sync in, in college versus, the you know, when, when you graduated and then the national team? Is it, Was there a big difference or was it just, did it, I guess I'm saying, you know, without having the college courses, was it a lot easier for you? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the whole added stress of trying to, you know, do homework and take tests is pretty stressful when you're trying to also focus on your sport. I think the biggest difference for me between, you know, collegiate travel and, and national teams, aside from not having the academic piece of it, was for the in the collegiate space, we only travel domestically. So a lot of our competitions would be, you know, to Arizona and maybe Florida, Ohio. But when you're on the national team, most of your competitions are going to be international. So, you know, that brings a whole slew of, of, of other things like, you know, time differences and jet lag and, and things like that. But yeah, the school element is a big component of, of collegiate synchro. And it's definitely a big weight off your chest when you don't need to think about that anymore while you're, you know, traveling and competing for, for the national team. Yeah. Well, you know, and the other thing that, that blew me away when I was starting to do some research on you is how much practice synch- synchro does or has. Oh the, yeah. The requirement <laughs> of synchro. I, I don't know that there are too many sports that have a higher threshold. I, I personally don't think that there is another sport that needs to train as much as we do. I mean, even gymnasts and figure skaters, I don't think that they spend as much time at practice. I mean, for us, it's, it's a full-time job. It's more than a full-time job. You know, we trained from, for the Rio Olympics, it was about 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. with maybe a half hour lunch break, which is really short, you know, and most of that time you are in the pool, you're treading water and it's, it's a lot. You're, you know, by the end of my career, I was just in a constant state of fatigue. Like I was just constantly tired. And it's funny uh, when I retired and, you know, I was no longer training 10 hours a day. 
I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is what it feels like to actually have energy and to not be exhausted all the time. It was like such a weird thing that like I just got used to that feeling of just, you know, always wanting to go to bed at like, you know, 9 p.m., waking up was super hard. Everything hurts. Everything is tired. Um, so, yeah, that was that was a, a very pleasant change for me. Did you have to was it was it I guess was it weird uh, adjusting your, your diet? Because you know when oh, if yeah. you're working eight working out eight nine hours, you're you're burning a ton of calories, and all of a sudden you're not. So yeah, gosh, I mean, even when I was swimming, I mean, for me personally, like I was one of the girls who was always told, you know, from age like seventeen that I had to lose weight, like always. So I still had to watch what I eat. Like I couldn't just eat whatever I wanted while I was competing. But definitely after I was done, like that was a big challenge for me and I mean to be honest it's three and a half years later I'm still you know kind of working through what what can I eat what what shouldn't I eat how often should I work out and yeah you're going from swimming for 10 hours a day to sitting in a desk for that same amount of time you're not exercising as much you you know you have to eat different things and it's a yeah. there's no like a road map like nobody teaches you oh you know when you're done competing this is what you should do so there's not a ton of resources for athletes who go through that transition. So it's it's definitely a challenge. Well, I know even with the, the athletes I've, I've talked to, uh, especially like NFL players who are, the three I've had on my show are 25, 26 years old, and they're retired, but they've never had a real job because they've never, through high school, college, and then obviously a couple of years in the pros, they've never had a, a full-time real job. Yeah. So all of a sudden they get done, they're like, oh, what do I do now? Yep. And I think yeah, it's, it, it's something that's not talked about very much, I think. And this is why, you know, I kind of started blogging and writing to kind of get some more, just open up the conversation about what happens to athletes after they retire. I think we're so focused on, you know, performance and medals and things like that. But once, once somebody's retired, it's like you, you don't hear about them anymore. I mean, we barely hear about Michael Phelps nowadays and he was, he's the greatest Big athlete thing, yeah. of all time. So yeah. And it's, it's much more challenging than I think people realize. Um, I think people just assume, Oh, well, you know, she went to the Olympics and that's so great. And so she's just going to have a successful career in, in whatever she does. And people just don't think about the, the struggles that athletes go through once their life completely changes when they retire. Well, that's what I was saying. I, I talked to a guy who played, um, uh, his last, the last team he played on was the Seattle Seahawks, but he was a team captain at North Carolina and, D, you know, D one program, all American. And he was, mm -hmm. he was actually, he goes, I thought it was interesting. You probably relate to this. He said he was jealous of all of his friends, whereas they were jealous of him when he was playing for the New Orleans Saints and the, you know, the Seahawks. He's now jealous of them because they've had four or five years to get their feet and, and have jobs, and, and they, they've already started mm -hmm. moving up. And he's mm -hmm. going out competing against twenty-two year olds. In his mind. That's, that's exactly how I felt. I was twenty-six when I retired, and I got my first job, like real job, at twenty-seven, and like that was my entry level position co coming into the business world, and. Yeah, you just feel like you're super late to everything. <laughs> you're getting such a late start. And yeah, you know, I understand. I spent, you know, so many years of my life focusing on the Olympics. And yes, I'm, I'm so proud of what I've accomplished. But I also have professional goals that I want to reach. And feeling like you're already behind is, you know, it's kind of a, an unsettling feeling. But you'll get through it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure I will. I just, you know, I'm very type a i you know i'm very ambitious so of course it's you know i just i want i want best for myself i want to accomplish a lot and it's just i have to remind myself that you know it's okay if, if, if i'm not quite there yet exactly well and you know it, there are so many 30 40 and 50 year olds that when they start over feel the same way yeah that's you know? that's very true and, and, yeah. but you're you're i guess the, the drive you had to become an olympic athlete Will, will make you successful in anything you, you choose to do. Yeah, I, I think so too. Yeah, there's so many skills and qualities that you learn while you're an athlete that can totally translate to the working world that can really benefit us, I think. 
I mean, I, I don't know what kind of work you do now, but I can, I can only imagine going, well, at least I'm not putting goop in my hair. And, <laughs> and, and Yes, yeah. So I actually, I work at Visa now, and they have a program specifically for Olympians and Paralympians. We actually just opened the applications for, you know, our next cohort. Oh, and cool. it's a rotation program, so we get to spend six months, um, four, four six-month rotations on different teams at Visa. So it's really, it's really interesting. And, you know, luckily, Visa is one of those companies that, really values the value that Olympians and Paralympians can bring to a company. So it's, it's really amazing. But yeah, sometimes when I'm, you know, when I'm tired in the morning, I have to, you know, get up early. I always think, you know what, I could be jumping into a cold pool right now and I'm not, and I don't need to. So I think this is going to be okay. You'll get through it. <laughs> you've done, you've done <laughs> exactly. worse. Or, exactly. Or harder, I should say. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> when, when, when you were getting ready for uh, London and then Rio, how d- did you? Were you training at different times? I guess like if you're in Rio or London and you're you're going to be, if you know you're going to be competing in the two to three o'clock in the afternoon, did you try and get used to training at home? You know, later at night, so so it'll be in the afternoon to you, or is it just you get there and you show up? Yeah, no, that's that's actually that's a good question. Before- for a competition so if we know that the competition itself is going to be like at an odd hour we will try to kind of mimic our our practices so that we swim like we do our whole you know run through of our program at the time that we would typically compete so but you you wouldn't do that until maybe like just a couple weeks before the competition um but yeah you definitely want your body to kind of get used to being ready at a certain time I mean, and this goes mostly for like big competitions. I mean, we've competed in China a couple of times and there were a few times when the com- like the actual competition swim was at like 9 p.m. And I remember being not only not used to swimming that late, but also being so incredibly jet lagged. I felt like I was just asleep like during dur- during the actual swim. So, yeah, we kind of we definitely try to prepare as best as possible for the circumstances that we'll, we'll face at the competition. Yeah. Cause I, I was just thinking, I'm actually going to Japan, Tokyo in April and oh, nice. the Olympics are coming up. And so, you know, we, we didn't want to go there in the summertime because obviously it's, it's craziness. I mean, it's crazy already with 38 million people in that city. <laughs> yeah. So I was just thinking. Yeah. The same going thing. to, yeah. I mean, going to, I don't know why for me going to China has been like the worst, jet lag I've ever experienced so much worse than going to Europe I'm I'm not sure I'm not sure why but like after even after spending a week in China I still wasn't used to the time difference um it was it was really really rough for me was it and I don't I have no idea but did you bring your own food or or do they set it up there and and you just eat what they have or how do you you know because I know a lot of athletes are on pretty strict diets yeah, so they they have food at every competition. Like either it'll be at the hotel or at the pool. They always provide all of the meals. But whenever we traveled to China specifically, I mean, I would always bring, you know, peanut butter, uh, like tuna packets, things like that. Because one like one thing I I don't like a ton of vegetables, and I know that you know Asian diets are very vegetable heavy. Yep. So there was not a whole lot that I could eat over there I mean I and I don't love you know kind of Chinese food in general so I remember the only things that I would actually eat would be rice and watermelon (laughs) and then I would you know I'd bring my own tuna so I made sure to have some protein and crackers and bars and peanut butter and things like that um just so I had some of my own you know food that food that I'm used to at home but usually like when we go to Europe typically would just bring protein bars and then like protein powder and uh, like an electrolyte powder, like a Gatorade or Cytomax is actually the one that I was kind of obsessed with for a long time. Um, But other than that, I think the food at the competitions is usually sufficient. See, that's, again, that's all, I think some of the things that people don't realize when they're watching, because that's just where my brain goes. You know, I'm like, Oh my God, you know, because like, my wife and I, we're just getting ready and we're like, okay, well, we're going to have to sleep. If we can sleep on the plane when we first get on the plane, 
and we wake up about four or five hours later, it'll be like we're waking up in the morning in Tokyo. And then when we land at four o'clock in the afternoon, we'll be more ready to, to you know what I mean? And, oh, totally. And, and no, I was definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, I understand that because even if you're going on vacation, you want to, you want to try to maximize your time yeah. there. You don't want to spend your time there sleeping or, you know, feeling bad because you're jet lagged. And for us, especially when we're competing, it's like, you want to be as prepared as possible. So yeah, I mean, I would, I would definitely try to come up with a plan beforehand. And, and you know, other, other people on my team, you know, didn't really care as much. I think because I'm more of a planner, um, I tried to kind of think ahead and yeah. sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't, but I think overall it, it definitely was a benefit. You know, I would feel much better when I, when, you know, when I would get to the meet or if I didn't feel good, I would be able to adjust to the time zone much faster. See, I think that that's gotta be a, a big fact, you know, and even like, I know altitude wise, you know, um, mm -hmm. when, when the Olympic games were in Mexico city, you know, you're up a mile over a mile. Mm -hmm. so I don't yeah. Know. We competed, we competed in, I think, I mean, really the only competition we competed at that did have that type of issue was, the 2011 Pan American Games were in Guadalajara, Mexico, yeah. which was yeah. up at altitude. So we actually did a six-week training camp in Colorado Springs at the Olympic Training Center there um, because it's you know pretty high altitude, and so we would be used to to that when we went to the competition. And I mean, if you can imagine synchronized swimming, it takes a lot of you know breath control. We're underwater for a long time. Trying to do that at altitude is it's terrifying. Yeah. Like you're like gasping for air and you, you just, you feel like you're going to pass out. But I'm, I am very glad that we did that preparation because if we hadn't and we had trained at sea level, you know, and then you go to the meet and all of a sudden you're, you can barely breathe because you're not used to the altitude. Um, again, we try to, we try to think of those things ahead of time and be as prepared as, as possible. Yeah, I did, I do uh, jujitsu. And I thought I was in pretty good shape until I went to Denver for work. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'm starting to spar with people. And I'm like, oh, my God, I have to take a break. I can't breathe. It, I mean, it's, just it's going up feeling. the stairs yeah. is like I would get winded. And I remember, I mean, even now, I my mom lives in Colorado. Every time I go, I always have the thought of like, gosh, am I really that out of shape? Like, I can't go up the stairs. The but, way. I mean, you do, you do get used to it, of course. Yeah, and, and especially if you're going to be out at a at a completely high level of, of athletic competition. Yeah. I, yeah. I definitely. Imagine. What did you, I mean, you had some really long flights and a lot of sitting around. What did you, what did you do to fill up your time? Was it reading, listening to music? I mean, obviously you were probably do, studying when you were in college. Yeah. I mean, yeah, like I said, in college, we didn't have too many, you know, actually really none, no trips outside of the U S. So, yeah, during, you know, the domestic trips, I would typically just be doing homework or, you know, sleeping during the longer flights internationally. I think, I think it kind of depended on where, where we're going. So if we were going to Europe, I would, you know, try to take a sleeping pill and sleep the entire time. So then if we got there in the morning, you know, that would have been, you know, ideal yeah. um, for the, for the time zone. And then other times where I, again, I tried to kind of plan ahead and be like, okay, if it's a 10 hour flight, I need to sleep for, you know, for five of those hours. Um, you know, I need, now I need to fill up, you know, five hours of doing something else other than sleeping on the flight. So I typically do just like a combination of things, you know, watch a movie, read. I mean, as soon as I start reading, I get sleepy. I don't know what it is about being on a plane and reading a book, but it literally <laughs> always just puts me, puts me to sleep. <laughs> Um, while I was competing, I used to be really into cross stitching, um, kind of a Russian thing. I feel like all Russian girls know how to cross stitch in the U S it's a little bit more of like a grandma thing. <laughs> so I used to bring like my cross stitching on the plane and then I would put on a movie and then I would do it as, you know, as I'm, as we're flying. Um, and then of course I tried to stand up and, you know, stretch a little bit in the, in the back of the plane, uh, to be honest, I, that was probably the worst yeah. thing that I was, that I was like, I was just not good about that. I could, you know, I could sit in the same seat for eight hours and never get up, <laughs> which is really bad. But I know, 
you know, for an athlete, that is really, really important. And I did notice a big difference in the way I felt if I was completely stationary the entire flight or if I actually got up and, you know, maybe just did a couple squats and, and stretched out. I mean, your body just gets so incredibly stiff. And, if, you know, we always fly economy. It's not like we fly business. So your cramps and God forbid you're in a middle seat. You know, it's just so uncomfortable. Oh, just wait, um, Maria. Just wait. <laughs> Are you saying it gets worse? If you're getting <laughs> stiff now. I can tell you, as I, oh. I, I played football for 10 years, wrestled, jiu-jitsu, was athletic my whole life, and now things just hurt more. Oh, oh gosh. That's... Uh. There's days when I'm going really to pretend there's days that I didn't like, hear that. Oh. <laughs> I mean, even be- even between my first and second Olympics, I was 22 in my first games and I was 26 in my second ones. And now I've given away my age, which I said I wasn't going to do. But you know what? Whatever. Here we are. Um, I didn't, even I didn't throw you under the bus. <laughs> I know. I know you didn't. I, I did it all by myself. <laughs> Um, but so even yet, even between my first and second games, I already felt a difference in my body and the way, the way I, you know, it responded to travel, the way it responded to, you know, less sleep and things like that. So I, we actually, I did get to fly business once to a competition and that was actually the the 2012 Olympics. And that was because, uh, the Olympics were in London and that was only because I had had back surgery, uh, six months prior and my doctor strongly insisted that I fly business so I could, you know, lean all the way back in the seat. And so luckily USC Synchro was kind enough to, you know, upgrade me, which definitely was a big, big, big help. I mean, when you can recline all the way back, I literally slept on the entire flight. Your experience is completely different. You, you land and you're refreshed instead of being (laughs) exhausted. Um, I mean, if it wasn't so darn expensive, Gosh, I'd, I, you know, do it all the time. I know we're flying. We're, we're actually, my wife, we're going to Japan and my wife hates flying. So we're actually, oh. we, the one thing we spent money on was upgrading to the business so she can have a little yeah, more Yeah, well now, and, yeah. yeah, now, I mean, you, you can, you can upgrade with your miles on, you know, I'm a loyal United customer since they're, since they're an Olympic sponsor. And I've definitely done all of the, you know, I've gotten the credit cards that maximize. Yeah you know, travel points and things like that, mainly so I can use them you know, not to redeem flights, but to get upgrades. So it's huge. I mean that's that's what I use my points for. And and Yeah. Yeah. You know, now yeah, that, I love it. Now that Southwest goes to um Hawaii, it makes me even happier. <laughs> yeah. And then you get to your vacation and you're just you're happy and ready to go. Oh, well, well, see, I'm excited about going to Japan, you know, and even just seeing the, the Olympics. Cause I was around during the 84 Olympics when they were here in Los Angeles and I went to some, the wrestling and I went to some of the swimming meets, uh, cause my mom was a swimmer and, uh, oh, wow. nice. and so we went to a lot of the swim meets and, and all that. And, and just the Olympics are, they're awesome. I mean, it's just a cool experience. Yeah. They're, they're truly amazing. I mean, I think there's nothing quite like the Olympics. I mean, even you know, Super Bowl or the FIFA World Cup, you know, huge, huge events. But to me, there's just something so unique about the Olympics and nothing, nothing will ever compare to it. And I mean, I, I went to the World Cup, the FIFA World Cup in 2018 in Russia. I worked um, with Visa's hospitality program. And yeah, it was really cool to be, you know, around the city. Everything is buzzing. There's so many fans everywhere. But it's still, it's not the same as that Olympic energy. I think it's truly so, so special. I think I would recommend to anyone to try to go to the Olympics at least once in their life. It's, it's just so cool. I know. Now we've got the, um, the LA games coming back, I think in 2028. Yeah. Yeah. It's super exciting. Which, which is exciting to, to see and experience it as a, as a resident. It kind of sucks. The traffic's going to be pretty bad. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Traffic is always a little traffic's already well, not a little, but pretty Angeles. rough. <laughs> so just adding, but it, I mean, it, you're right. I mean, it, it's it's hard to explain to somebody to watch somebody win a gold medal. It's just yeah, like, it's so cool. Yeah, forget about it. I saw a couple of gold medals yep. get one for the uh, U.S. and the wrestling, and it was like, mm-hmm. wow. Yeah, this is this does not suck. How do you, I have a, a few synchronized swimming questions for you? <laughs> sure. How did you get started? How does someone go, ah, I'm going to do synchro swimming? (laughs) 
Yeah, well, so Synchro is kind of a, well, in the U.S. specifically, it's kind of a regional sport. So it's yeah. not like it's everywhere, like swimming or gymnastics. So I moved to the U.S. from Russia when I was nine. And the, the suburb of San Francisco that we moved to has a big synchro club. They're very well known in the community. They have, I think we have 20, 21 or 22 Olympians um, who have come out of, of this club. So I literally just got a flyer at school for, it was like a crash course in synchronized swimming. I had no idea what that was. Um, and I had done some gymnastics, like a little bit of gymnastics, a little bit of swimming back in Russia. And so this just seemed like the perfect combination of those sports. And, you know, as a little girl, you see, you see these, you know, these girls in sparkly swimsuits and there's music and it looks like they're like dancing in the water and it just looks so fun. Uh, so that's, that was kind of like the initial draw for me. And then as I started training and, you know, getting more into it, I, I'm super competitive. So it was more the side of me that just wanted to get better and to improve. And it was fun for me to see those improvements. And then, and then I just, you know, wanted to be the best finger swimmer that I could. Um, and then, yeah, then I got stuck in it for life. Is there an ideal body type for synchro? Yes. And I do not have that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's funny, like looking back, I'm like, gosh, I really am not genetically built to do synchro. So sometimes I'm like, gosh, like good job, Maria, for actually making it, you know, the two Olympics without having the genetic advantages. Um, so a typical synchronized swimmer that, I mean, if you're tall and your legs are long, your legs will look high and long and beautiful in the water. So you're kind of, it's kind of like, you know, a ballerina, the, the slimmer and the, the, the nicer those lines are, the better. Um, I think also flexibility is a, is a big uh, part of it. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of kids are born just having more flexible joints and, and muscles. And I was not one of those kids. I mean, I had, I had an injury in my hip. So there was, you know, certain stretches would really hurt it. So I wasn't as flexible as I really should have been, even with working on that. Um, and I think, yeah, I think just my, my height, I'm 5'5". Five five. Uh, both of my the duo partners that I swam with in London and then in Rio, they were both taller than me. Um, and then just being, like, thin, I guess, is, you know, just it just makes you look better in the water. And unfortunately, it is an aesthetic sport. So body image is is important and it's tough because i mean as we all know you know in recent years the media has you know brought this to light so much more how how things like that can affect you know the way that you see yourself and then you can get into unhealthy patterns and and things like that so we definitely have that that kind of danger um in the sport because so much of it is focused on the way that you look well uh, yeah my my sister did gymnastics all the way through college uh, at Santa Barbara, so D one, and it, it's a subjective judging sport, just like seeing. Yep. And it, my my sister got weighed every day. And yeah, we uh, she at one get point on, every day for, of college. Yeah, on one of the teams that I was on, um, we had a weigh in every Wednesday morning, and so you know Tuesday evening, it's like you could just see. We, we were training at the Olympic Training Center in Colorado at this time, and you could just see everybody's dinner was, you know, a third of, of what they normally eat. And then Wednesday morning, it's like nobody would eat breakfast. Then we would get weighed, and then people would try to, like, you know, stuff their face because we had to go to practice right away. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, but it's just it's just the reality of, of our sport. And there's, I mean, I, I was fortunate enough to never – like I never got to that point where I was, you know, completely starving myself or, you know, was bulimic or anything like that. But I, it was still constantly on my mind, you know, that I should be eating healthier and I should be eating less and, and things like that. And it wasn't until the very end of my career, maybe like the last two years that I feel like I actually figured out, okay, for me, this is what I need to do to look, you know, the way that I want to look. Um, and again, I think Synchro is one of those more like unique sports because in gymnastics, for example, like you can be a little bit more muscular 
it may be a little bit bigger, but if you can do all of the tricks and things like that, then it's like, you know, it doesn't really matter. In synchro, you you have to be, you know, like small and toned, but you also have to have enough muscle to be able to, to not only sustain you through a 10 hour practice, but to, you know, to swim at a certain level, you know, it's, it it's, that combination I think is, is, is really hard to attain. Cause I, I was watching some of your, your, your videos and I'm just like, holy, I can't use the word, but I, I was dumbfounded. It was incredible to, to think that, I mean, I'm a pretty good swimmer and you know, my mom uh, was a competitive swimmer. And then, so she taught me how to swim when I was a kid. Uh, like bait and um you know i can i can dive and do all this stuff but to see what you guys do underneath the water was I, it's gotta be i don't know for me it's frustrating i hate for i hate subjective judging and that's the it's, one thing i always yeah, hate about gymnastics because yeah. i'd watch I'd, I'd, a, I'd go to all my sister's gymnastics meet and go hold on she did just as good as that girl and that girl just you know but it's what the judges wanted to see or what they were hoping to see or well but the thing about gymnastics and, and even figure skating, and it, I think yeah. in any objective sport, they try to make it more like as objective as possible. So in gymnastics, they have start values. So, you know, if, you're, if your routine is more difficult, but you don't execute it as well, okay. you know, you're still going to get credit for it. In synchro, because all of the routines are so different from one another, it's like it's just hard. It's harder to make it more objective, but they're we're, they're definitely trying to, you know, even considering things like, you know, the, a team submitting a video of their routine prior to the competition so that judges can evaluate the difficulty of their routine, Before so that when they judge it, they're just judging you know, how well they execute it. Oh, that's crazy! But it's definitely frustrating. I mean, so many times in my career, it's like you you're like, oh, I did, you know, I did better than, than this team and you don't end up getting the score that you deserve. I mean, literally that was like the epitome of my career. It wasn't until the Rio Olympics that actually that was the first international competition I went to that I was so shocked to see our scores in a good way. I had never experienced that before. Like this sounds really kind of depressing, but it's true. <laughs> like literally every competition I went to, it was just disappointment. You know, I just, constantly was thinking gosh like we deserve more we deserve better and Rio 2016 was so amazing I was like gosh this feeling is like so so cool feeling like you you got what you feel like you deserve and, so and then you retired <laughs> and then I retired I mean I knew I knew I was going to retire kind of going into the Olympics sure um and I really think it was just it was time and but at the same time, it was kind of cool to be able to end end on a high, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, um, like I said, I watched some of your, your your competitions with Anita, and I was like, you guys were dead money. I mean, yeah, one arm might be a little higher in the wall, you know. I mean, when you start looking at first nitpicking things, that's but you guys were like perfect. So I don't understand. But those are the things. Yeah, I mean, for, to a naked eye and to somebody who doesn't know synchro, you you look at our routine and, and think, oh, well, they're they're great. You know, why didn't they win? But when you know Synchro better, you see all those little nuances and those little errors and mistakes and, you know, unmatched positions. And you see, like, and that's, that's what makes the difference. And that's what's judged. And if you compare us to the best in the world, they're doing, you know, they're moving faster. They're higher in the water. They're doing much more difficult moves. So there's, there's just a lot of work to be done. There's, there's so many things that can be, you know, fixed and improved on the work literally never ends. I mean, you're, you're chasing perfection, which of course is, you know, yeah. unattainable yet. That's what we're trying to work towards every single day. Oh, you guys came what ninth at the Rio? Yep. So we finished 11th in London and the ninth in Rio. And actually Anita and I, when we competed at the world championships in 2015, we finished 12th and so to move up oh, from yeah. 12th to 9th in one year is actually unheard of in synchro so everybody always asks oh you know did you win did you get a medal and when i say that i got ninth, you know people are always like oh well at least you still got to you know you still got to go almost like you know trying to console me and i always say oh i was so happy to get ninth. like for us it felt like a medal 
And I don't care that I wasn't on the podium. I mean, we knew we were good enough for that. But for us, moving up three spots in one year and just beating some of the other duets that we that have that we've never beaten before, like that was so rewarding and that was so cool. So, you know, there's you know only one duet, one team is is going to win at the Olympics, but that doesn't mean that all the other teams didn't accomplish something amazing. See, and I, I definitely don't feel that, that way about consoling you. It, you came ninth in the world. You know, you, yeah, you, it's it, freaking cool. Yeah, if, if you come in ninth in the world in anything, that's, you know, an organized sport. I mean, it's not like, well, I'm ninth in the world at flipping a flower upside down or something, but I yep. mean, like a legitimate yep. sport, just, I mean, that's. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I just think it's, it's the coolest experience ever. I mean, it's, it's a high price to pay, uh, you know, higher for some people than others. I feel like for me personally was, you know, in, in a lot of different ways, it was a very high price to pay, but would I do it all over again? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I hope so. I mean, like I said, there, there, there won't be too many more times in your life where you get to go, I, where you even get the opportunity to become ninth or, you know, top 10 in the world of any, in anything you do. Oh yeah, not yeah, not at all. And I know when I was going into Rio, and like I said, I was I knew that that was going to be you know my last go round. I wasn't going to you know train for for Tokyo 2020. And I remember like getting to the village in Rio, and just every single day having the thought in my mind of, I, like I kept telling myself, "You're never going to do this again. Like you're never going to be in the Olympic Village or in the Olympic yeah. venue as an athlete ever again. So soak it all in." remember as much as you can and I like I feel like I remember those Olympics so vividly and versus you know versus London I I mean at your first game it's like everything is so overwhelming everything is so exciting that you almost like it's like so overwhelming that you can't you don't remember a lot of it yeah, yeah, or like at least the details of it um but definitely with Rio it's like I have just so many memories and I like I remember like the physical feeling that I had, you know, in so many of those moments, um, that, yeah, it's just really cool. Awesome. Well, hey, thank you so much for the time. What's the best way for my listeners or anyone that wants to, to, to follow you and get more information about sink swimming from you? What's the best way to, to stay in touch with you? Yeah. So I'm mostly active on Instagram and my handle is M Coraleva. So M K O R O L E V A. Um, would love to, you know, connect with anybody who, who wants to, um, on Instagram. And then I do have my own website and blog and it's just Maria So, you know, just my, my name, um, and Maria spelled M A R I Y A. Um, it's not Mariah, it's Maria. <laughs> uh, when we were moving to the U S my, my documents were made in France and for some reason they just stuck away my name and oh, now really? I'm stuck with it for life. <laughs> That's awesome though. I mean, so that happens so, to so many people, but yeah. 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 <laughs> so yeah. I mean, thank you so much for having me and, you know, to be for the opportunity to share my experience. It's been really great. And, you know, I'd love to connect with, with any of your listeners or anyone who's you know, just wants to connect about anything. <laughs> or or um, reading books. Yes, exactly. I have my latest, my latest Instagram story your, your say. Little, your little <laughs> book club. I like that. Yeah, yeah. I want I, I want to check out that totally um, badass book. Yeah, no, it was it was good, and I mean the whole premise of this of the you know what I just posted on on Instagram stories is I have so many like physical books that I've read that were great books, but. You know, it's like, I'm not going to reread them again and I don't have space for more books. So yeah. I was just thinking like, why don't I just give them away? Like maybe some of my followers would be interested. And, you know, it's almost like this is Dakota the Traveling Pants. You can mail off a book and then they can pass it on to another person. And, you know, why not share, you know, just a good book that I've read. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what comes out of it. I think it would be fun. It's a great idea. I like it too. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Well, enjoy your day. Uh, thank you so much again for your time. I truly appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. This is awesome. Okay. Thanks, Maria. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Pete. Bye-bye. Bye.